All right, guys, here we go. About to start. Uh, here we go. Check it out. That is the voice of Mike Marjama. Mike is a lot of things. A media personality. Mike Marjama. And Mike Marjama. Catcher. Mike Marjama. A former major league catcher for the Seattle Mariners. The Mariners win it. And an advocate spreading awareness about men with eating disorders. On today's special episode of Mental Note Podcast, we sit down for a Q&A session with both Mike and his mom, Kim. We'll talk about how Mike's disorder took root, how he and his family found treatment and recovery, and why he retired from baseball in order to help raise awareness of this deadly disease. Along the way, we'll also dig into what it takes to live a well-rounded life and how to support young men to embrace a more healthy view of masculinity. You're listening to Mental Note Podcast. I'm Ellie Pike. Let me just have you both introduce yourselves kind of informally. You're, you're Kim, but I'll let you introduce yourself, where you're from, what, what do you do? I am Kim Marjama. I am from, Sac- well, north of Sacramento, a little town called Granite Bay, California. And we have been there, my husband and I raised our three children there. And um, I am a OBGYN nurse practitioner and have specialized in adolescent health for the last 22 years. And now I am still doing that, but chasing my children around the country um, with their activities, whatever they do. That's awesome. And Mike, introduce you. And I am Mike Marjama. I'm a uh, former major league catcher for the Seattle Mariners. Um, and I'm now an ambassador for the National Eating Disorder Association and traveling around and speaking on behalf of uh, the millions of men that are suffering with eating disorders. And I like to think really the more that are suffering overall with mental illness and, and really uh, everyone on their walks of life as they struggle with things in life. So I like to think I'm an advocate for humanity and, and really bringing about hopefully positive change. Awesome. Well, thank you both for being here. And um, so we just want to hear a little bit about your story. This is such a treat to have a Q&A with both of you. Mike, let's start with you. And, you know, just the very beginning of your eating disorder story, what were some of the first signs of your eating disorder as it started to crop up? Well, I think when we start talking about eating disorders, we start talking about this, the... um the stereotypical traits that are associated, whether it be perfectionism, obsessiveness, control, um, any of the, the traits that, um, you know, kind of we, we get inherited. As, and so it's, I had those signs early when I was a, was a child, right, when I'm a baby. and Like from birth. From birth. Thank you, mother. <laughs> and so having them, it was one of those things where um, I was very... Uh, enthusiastic, but I also had to have control. And, and so all these passions of mine started kind of manifesting into me being creative and trying to create some things. And ultimately that stemmed into getting into like recess in junior high school and, you know, playing tag and wanting to get tagged and then wanting to get a girlfriend and these fascinations that I had these kind of traits ended up turning into how can these manifest now into this desire to have a body um, that I looked like the male models and that would help me get a girlfriend. And really, uh, we think back to those days and for me it was Abercrombie and thinking about the guys with their shirts off and it was like, well, how do I be that guy? Because if I'm that guy, I'm getting a girlfriend, period. So I rationalize it. Well, if I don't eat anything, then I won't get fat. And if I work out a ton, I get big and strong. And um, as we know, it's not that easy. (laughs) And so, uh, you know, I think with anything, we look at the fad diets, we look at what can get me to where I want to get to now. And that was my way of rationalizing it. You know, one of my friends said, hey, why don't you come wrestle? And I, it really, it gave me tools to feed into this negative self body image. When I heard you speak earlier, so I had the privilege of hearing you speak at a conference. Um, you said, you know, I like to be in control, but the one thing that I couldn't be in control of was the eating disorder. The eating disorder had control over me. Can you talk a little bit about what that felt like to be in your body and not have control? It's the worst feeling ever. Um, and I think that's why when people are, uh, people of control like myself, when you lose that, it's a freak out moment. And I think that for me is I was so malnourished though at points, I didn't really even know 
right? I thought everything was kind of normalized. I think we start seeing that more often is when you are severely malnourished, you're not performing an optimal brain, fun brain function. So in what ways can we address that, right? So when people think about eating disorders, like, well, it's a mental illness. Well, yeah, but it has the high, highest mortality rate of any mental illness. Well, why? Because it affects your body, right? So we like to think that we can affect it by only looking at the mind. But we know that if you're severely malnourished, no matter what type of mental skills or coping skills or any sort of treatment you try to give to a patient or someone struggling with an eating disorder, it's not going to work because your brain cannot function properly and you probably have an overfascination with food. And so for me, I've always tried to focus on the longest time was, it was my mental game or my sports psychology that helped very much so. But it was also the fact that the professional help was actually getting me nourished enough to where I could be receptive to those ideas. Absolutely. So let's back up before yes. you found that professional help. Mom, we have mom here. Her name is Kim. So Kim, what was that like for you? Because I know you care a lot about early intervention and you are a healthcare provider. And here you are watching your son get really sick throughout high school. What was that like for you to find treatment for him? Well, I was desperate. I, you know, I had given advice to so many people about just screening, you know, and I, I was, um, I'm an OBGYN. And so I would deal with girls who had uh, absence of menstrual cycles or and um, other physical symptoms and to watch my son have a lot of these behaviors um, was terrifying and and my husband was really um, skeptical at first when I'm like this is we've got to do something this is not okay and he's like he's gonna grow out of it and I'm like yeah yeah you're probably right he probably will grow out of it and, and thinking I could uh, just maybe intervene on his behalf or do some different things and he would get better and he didn't get better. He got worse. And it, it, it got to the point that we were really terrified that he would lose his life. And so um, it didn't really matter anything anymore. School didn't matter. Uh, baseball didn't certainly matter. Sports didn't matter. None of these things mattered that we were just wanting to save his life. And it was, um, it was terrifying and desperate at the time is the feeling that we got just this, just this desperate uh, attempt to do whatever we could do to help him. And the thought, I, I do remember vividly thinking, you know, uh, he might die. And, and I couldn't live with myself if I didn't do every possible thing that I could to stop that from happening. And so I was terrified at the time. Oh, I can only imagine. Yeah. And so were you able to find treatment centers that took males, especially adolescent males? Well, there, you know, in our community, there were only a couple of programs that were in Northern California, period. And the cost for them were upwards of sixty dollars to $80,000. And so, you know, trying to scramble about how are we going to come up with an extra sixty to eighty grand in the next couple of weeks was you know, was pretty, was pretty tough. And so um, we were fortunate enough that I work uh, for an organization um, for Kaiser Permanente that happened to have an intensive eating disorder program. The problem is, is they only can take, you know, a couple kids at a time. They're looking at, you know, eight, 10, 12 children at a time. And, um, and they have to wait for a spot to open up. So, a spot happened to be open. There wasn't, it wasn't specific for males or females, but there weren't males in the program. It just wasn't really talked about and it wasn't really supported that there would be males and certainly athletes. So Mike, what was that like for you to enter treatment? One, were you slightly resistant? No, not, not at all. Oh, I did not me. resist at all. I was like, guys, throw me into treatment. I want to get better right now. Yeah. He said, you guys are crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. Right. But that's the, I mean, you know, and I think that's the dynamic we have, you know, being a teenage guy sure, you know, right? you need teen and it's hard, it's a hard dynamic. And I think the adolescent yeah. phase, right. We're trying to even come into our own bodies. We're growing through puberty and it's like, I, I don't even want to talk to my parents. I don't, I'm trying to fit in at school. I'm trying to get popular. I'm trying to get a girlfriend. Trying to be cool. I'm trying to be cool. Yeah. Like, there's so many factors 
factors going on. And my parents are like, well, you haven't eaten this. Or I'm like, oh my God, how is that going to look on me at school now? Right? <laughs> right. And so I started hiding myself on a lot of the times. Like I would go into the, the library and eat lunch alone, or I'd go eat out on a hallway. And, you know, people are like, well, you're just the odd kid. And I was like, oh, trust me, I'm, you know, like there, I'm battling something right now, but I'm also trying to hide it. So then mom's like, yeah, you're going to go into treatment. I'm like, oh God, I'm going to get judged. And I think that that's oftentimes what we don't, it's a hard thing for us, right? It's a hard thing for men to not feel emasculated by the, by the topic or even, I mean, let's just take this out of, out of the eating disorder frame. Let's start talking to this about mental illness in general. Right. We have this association right. that if you have a mental illness, we're going to put you in a straight jacket and then you're going to go into a room with padded walls, right? Right, and, and it's like, all white, right? Like that's exactly. what a treatment center and looks like. like right. and- exactly, and you're just like, guys, like, uh, what? And so I had the opportunity to tour the facilities here in Denver for ERC. I was like, this is awesome awesome. They're like, we have a Zen room. We have a massage room. We have this fireplace. You know, it's like, do all the patients use it? No, but it's there in case they want it right. There's this option. There's a way of a holistic approach that isn't just to let's define the, 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 the mind, let's not define just the body. It's taking the holistic approach to making you, uh, you know, the balanced individual. I think if we all looked at it that way and said, you know, if you were to walk around and say, um, can you have too much balance in your life? I don't think you're ever going to get somebody to say, nope, (laughs) nope, nope, nope. You, you, there's too much balance, right? Like you need to be out of whack. No, like you need balance in everything in life, no matter what it is. And so it's finding where that is and, you know, treatment and everything like that is, is, is such an amazing place in the way it's progressed through the years. And I'm still, even being very new to it is still being, um, you know, and did it with knowledge on, on how the field has grown and it's incredible. Right. And we know diets are not the helpful way for anybody to learn no. a good relationship with food. Right? No. And I think that that's part of our culture, right? We're, we're in this culture now where it's, it's microwave. I forget the years. It's got to be 60, 70, right? And the microwave gets into you push a button and two minutes, you get what you want. And you're like, well, we do that for everything now, right? Like you graduate college, you want to make a million dollars out of college and you're going to do it in your first year. And you're like, whoa, like it doesn't work that way, right? You want to have this amazing body. I don't care how many teas, pills, powders, whatever you want to take, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in a week or two weeks or three weeks. It's not going to happen. So it's redefining what health is. We can say that you look at a person, this is what our culture does. There's a thin person that looks athletic. They look like they're in shape. They're healthy. Quote, but, quote, unquote, quote, unquote, healthy. Right. But what you don't understand is they have multiple organ failure going on because they're abusing something or, or because they're shutting down their body in certain ways. So you may look healthy for sure, but it doesn't mean your body is healthy. And so bringing it back to your story, I imagine that there were times that you look like a normal guy, right? Oh, or yeah. people were not recognizing this eating disorder because you were a male or you were an athlete or chalking it up to like the norms of society. Well, I think mom would say that too, right? Yeah. Like I was a hard worker. For sure. That enthusiasm, that energy, that drive, it is something that was innate in him. And it gave him this unique, creative um, drive and, and his hardworking work ethic. He, he's, he's, well, no one will outwork him. However, it also gave him this rigid control to commit to something that was unhealthy. And he was all in. I mean, he's been all in and he was all in. So would you chalk any of that up to perfectionism? Uh, yeah. You know, people ask me, they're like, do you still struggle? Do you still have triggers? I'm like, of course I do. It's life. Like we are always going to have triggers and struggles, but through treatment, I've learned with healthier ways to deal with those things. Right. And so choose the unhealthy path. So we go out to dinner and I'd have my fork right on my right side and the, the knife right there. And they'd be perfectly in line. They'd be perpendicular with the edge of the table. And well, he has all to set sudden, everything up organized. Oh, here we go. And, and who and do you like think, and say, and say, who do you think <laughs> reaches over and moves the knife a quarter turn? So it's not pointing at 12 o'clock. Now it's pointing at like one and my inner, you know, I'm just like, Oh my gosh, you know, and I'm sitting there. I'm like, breathe, 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 nope. breathe, 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 breathe. Right. And then it's like, okay, I gotta move. It. I gotta move it. And so now there are times where I do have to move it. And then there are times where I don't notice, or then I do notice. I'm like, okay, it's not that big of a deal. So you can't it's see okay on a podcast, but watch this. It's yeah, fun. See? 
but that he won't. I'm gonna he, narrate this. Kim just <laughs> knocked his water bottle over, and I we're gonna see over. how long it takes it before Mike has to fix it because he's a perfectionist. Right, it's bothering him right now. It's eating him. He's alive. staring at me, and he's trying so hard not to look at the bottle. No, right, see? but I've learned that this is just. An, it's just a water bottle on its side, rolling around right there. She's trying hard right now. She I'd knows. like to be a fly on the wall at your Christmas dinner. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, it's a lot of fun. But see, that's, I think, what's part of what's made this so special is the value of having the recovery, of having this to where now I'm able to speak about it more and having mom and the people that were involved in it go, you know what? Like we went through this hard time, but we are so much stronger now, right? So at that time, like to answer your previous question even further, it's like, yeah, I hated mom and dad. I had nothing. I didn't want anything to do with them. I'm like, screw you guys. You guys are putting me through hell. I can't stand you. But now, like in hindsight, like I get choked up about it because it's like my parents just love me. They just wanted the best for me, right? So we get to have a deeper relationship. I'll say probably mom and our relationship has gotten deeper because of it, right? And it's it's they made it so much more precious. So the little things like her knocking my water bottle over right now, as much as it irritates me, it's like it's, it's a world record. Like, you haven't picked it up yet. Yeah, you're I'm just gonna say you're He's doing great. He's also holding his fingers <laughs> together. <laughs> well, let me ask him. So what? You know, you've watched your son be really sick. You've watched him go oh, through yeah. this process of recovery that's not perfect, this long. Yeah. Um, you've watched his perfectionism still serve him in good ways, right? Like he became... Very much so. Uh, yeah, he played baseball for the Mariners. That's really huge. And he's doing an incredible job as a Nita ambassador, traveling all around, sharing his story. So how have you seen him change through recovery? Well he's still the same Michael he's always been. He's still a perfectionist. He's still enthusiastic. He's still 100% in no matter what the task or or the game or the event is. He's 100% in. The difference is now is that he does so much more to help himself in a healthy way. He he will um he's figured out what how to help him how to work, how to set healthy boundaries. He has um, a lot of positive affirmations. He has, he has rituals too, but there's a part of OCD that's healthy, that's organized and... and um, it gives you confidence. For me, it gives me confidence. So, so mom talks about those things. So by having accomplishments, so a lot of people will write down tasks for the day and they feel like when they can check off one of their tasks for the day, they feel like they've accomplished something and it's given a momentum to the next task and the next task. So creating a list, right? So some people are like, I just, I can't create a list because then I obsess about it and all this other stuff. For me, what it does is allows me to have organization in which, okay, I need to get this done. I need to get this done. Now when I cross it off, it's like, booyah, I just finished that thing. I'm on to the next one. And then I accomplished that one. And not not that it's doing it in a healthy way. It's just doing it to where I feel like it gives me direction and not a negative direction. So my list and the things that I come up with, or maybe it'd be a little bit of journaling in the morning, or maybe it'd be that focus that maybe I just, maybe it's just read a good quote and it just gets me started on the right foot that now those, the directions and choices I'm taking on that list are now done in a healthy way, right? So rather than on that list, if I had, um, formally I had, I had to go to the, the gym for a few hours. Now it's like, no, 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 I don't need to go for a few hours. I need to go for an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, but I'm going to focus on, um, just feeling good. So I used to go to the gym back. Like, okay. I've got to do this many sets of this many reps. And if I didn't do it, or I was going to run this far. And if I didn't do it, if I walked to any point, I'd punish myself and restart over again. Now it's like, if I need to walk, I'll walk. If I go there for five minutes and I'm not feeling it, I'm going to leave, right? Before I would push myself to do the extreme. Now it's like, I remember the other day, it was, it was um, I had just gotten back from DC to do the congressional, to do the briefing with Congress. And I had meetings for like three days straight. And it was all day. And then I fly all the way back from DC to California and I get in and I was jet lagged. So I'm like, I got to just get up and go for a walk. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to run over to the gym really quick and just kind of go on the treadmill and walk. And I was like, well, I'll see if I can get a good workout in. And so I had anticipation of getting a good workout in. But that afternoon I had to fly out here and I just felt like I just, I needed to move my body. That's just the feeling I had. But instead of going to the gym and working out for two, three, four, you know, to over exercise and, and because I felt like I needed to do it, I literally walked in there, got on a treadmill for like five minutes and was like, okay, I'm done. Like, I just, I don't need any more. And, you know, I'm thinking about a lot of people I know that are, tr they're on that brink of is recovery for me. It is this possible for me? And they would hear your story being like, well, that's awesome, but how do I get there? How do I get to that point of balance or moderation or listening to my body? 
So can you give me kind of a clue into some of how you learned to get there? Um, my, my coach um, in junior college, his name is Andy McKay. He's now the player development director for the Mariners. And he talked about uh, the mental game, sports psychology side of things. And, and when he taught me about coping skills and mantras, right? I heard about that in treatment. I'm like, ah, come on, guys. I'm a dude. I don't want to talk about meditation. But then I realized like, it was helping me on the field. And so I started incorporating that in life. So I use these little tools. Now I will say this, it doesn't happen overnight. You don't just, you don't just go like, okay, I want to be recovered. Boom. I'm recovered. It doesn't happen that way. It takes baby steps. There are times I would relapse. There are times I would go back. There are times, but I learned at every step along the way that every obstacle I faced was an opportunity for me to grow. You cannot change the fact that you have an eating disorder or you are in it. Like you cannot change the past. This is where you're at, at this moment. Um, but for me, it was getting with the professional care, getting nourished to where my brain could function properly. And then from that point, what I started noticing is the old Viktor Frankl quote, I'll go back to this again. I speak about it all the time between stimulus and response, there's that blank period. And that's our basic human freedom, the power to choose. You don't have to just be a reaction. You get to choose when something happens, you get to choose your reaction. Attitude is a decision. And I decided that from that day forward, when I read that quote, and then I read that book, and man search for meaning, and the power that that had on me saying, I have a choice now. Now, that wasn't going to be possible without me being nourished or anything like that, but I started using little tricks like that. So when every time something came into my mind, and I always talk about the superhero as well, um, I viewed myself as being a superhero, like Elsa in Frozen is the example I always use, but she's got this amazing power. And if she uses it for bad, she has this, this power. And for me, that would say be my perfection, my obsessiveness, my compulsive, like all these things. If I use it for bad, I become the villain. I'm Elsa, I freeze everything. Now, if I use it for good, I become the hero. So at what point do I start making these conscious decisions when things are happening? I'm gonna make that decision to be the superhero. And every time I did that, I started noticing I gained confidence in myself. I wasn't this guy that was summed by his eating disorder. That was the eating disorder cannot live without you. You can live without the eating disorder. And so by making those conscious decisions, it's not going to happen overnight, but I like those gold. I like the little nuggets, the little gold nuggets. I like the baby steps. And I think those little processes of turning those obstacles into opportunities, um, you gain confidence and that helps you along the way. I think that that's really powerful pe for people to hear. It's just one step at a time. It's finding the help and the treatment that you need also, but knowing that it's a long road and it's not linear and it's going to look like a whole bunch of loops and turns, but knowing your value direction and where you went ahead. And for you, that was a lot of like you went ahead in the direction of like choosing and feeling your own power, right. And valuing certain things. So what were some of the things that you valued along the way that just helped you choose recovery? Oh, well, again, my career. I want to save my career in baseball-wise, right? But then it was my, my family, my friend. I, I wanted to be okay. Yeah, he wanted because, a place to live. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> he would have thrown him out if he didn't go to co recovery. Yeah, that's He true. wanted a place to live. Yeah, but I, I wanted, yeah, right? But I wanted I wanted to play. I wanted, the, I wanted to be able to play baseball. I wanted to do these great things. Um, but it was, you know, it, it, like you said, it's not an easy road, but that's where the beauty in life is for me. The beauty in life are those struggles, is overcoming those struggles, and I'm still here. I love that something that was given to you, that you said, you know, I fought this, I fought recovery, and, you know, it was uncomfortable, you're the only male in treatment, and you have all these goals and accomplishments that you want to move towards. I love that it sounds like at some point you started to soak it in for yourself, and that it became yours to own, and it was your choice as you moved forward. Yeah. Um, and so I want to jump back to, you, you said one of your values and your goals was, you know, I want to play, I want to play major league baseball. Um, you played for the Mariners. So what was that like for you to be in athletics where it's so hardcore, so competitive and you were in recovery? Well, it's tough. It's tough. I would say it this way. It's the, um, we always think, and here's my personality. We'll say it this way. Uh, you look at celebrities, you look at like, say the Anthony Bourdain, Kate Spade, you look at the people that they say, well, you have, they seem like they have it all. I've noticed that a lot of times I work myself so hard to make, or, and this is me, to accomplish something. Now, for more people that may say more business savvy, I'll give it to you this example this way. We are working so hard at times. We push ourselves to extremes. We will do anything 
to be able to get more money in business so we can buy our freedom. So we can take the vacation and go to this place. We are, and so we're spending all this time working hard so we can buy freedom. But in doing so, we are sacrificing freedom to work so hard to buy freedom. It's a complete paradox. So at what point are we doing the same thing to our bodies? At what point are we trying to get somewhere to get to this result, but we realize the result is, the life isn't about, I forget the quote, it's like, oh, you have the born date, your death date, and then there's a dash in the middle, life's about the dash. Like, it's cliche, but you have this end period. The end goal is not there. So for me in baseball is I need to get to the big leagues. I need to get to the big leagues. If I don't, I'm a failure. But then you get to the big leagues and uh, you want to start. And then you start and then you want to make the all-star team. And you make the Oscar team, then you want to make Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame, or you want to make this amount of money. Well, that's not going to. You got to make this. And then you, when you get there, so you get the big leagues. You're so worried about getting sent down. You're worried about losing it. How do you get to a point where that is enough? So we never find a place of of peace, of balance, of what is okay, what is essential to my human, what's essential for me just being a human being. And so for me, it became that in baseball. It was very hard to find that for me was, was I okay to be acceptable? Because my whole life I had worked to become a big leaguer and I finally got it. And knowing my personality, I have to work for something. So I felt like I just kind of lost everything I needed to work for. So what was the decision like to leave? It was easy. Really? Tell me about not that. Not easy. Sorry, it's not easy. It, but it wasn't an overnight thing. Everyone goes, oh, well, here. But this is mom comes down to San Francisco, and the Giants are having an opening night at, at, at AT&T. We're in San Francisco, and my family comes up to my room, and I have, a, I have a therapist there because my body's hurting. But I also have my computer, my phone, and my tablet out. I'm looking at all the scouting reports, and they're like, hey, let's go out to the Mexican food place. It's right, it's right below the hotel here. We'll go to Mexican food. We'll eat. And I was like, no, I'm not going. I'm like, why? Well, I got to prepare. If I'm not prepared, I could get sent down if I have a bad game. And so I didn't enjoy it. I spent so much time so worried about just trying to stay there and not lose my job as a big leaguer. I don't want to get sent back down to the minor league. So the whole time I'm stressed out, not even enjoying it. There were years I've called mom saying, you know, I don't, I'm not really liking baseball anymore. I'm just, it's a job. I feel like I'm stressed out all the time. You know, I know mom could attest to that more. It's just, it was hard for me. Well, I think the underlying, you know, the eating disorder was just a, another symptom of what the underlying issue was for you. You know, it was the, the depression, the anxiety that goes hand in hand with, um, nice job. How long was that? That he just picked the water bottle up. <laughs> Mike just picked up the water bottle. That was good. 15 that minutes. That was a solid work. It just rolled honey. near me. I'm sorry. I didn't pick it up. But I think that the underlying issue was really the perfectionism led to a certain level of anxiety for you and the anxiety, you know, the flip side of one of, of anxiety is depression. And he really, uh, has had that and, and we'll probably always have that. We, I think all humans have a certain level of that, but for him, it was hard to see him, um, struggle and be, really wound tight at the major league level. Uh, it was great. We loved it. We love seeing him achieve his dream. It, it was, it's just surreal. And we, we were so proud of him, but we also watched, we also know him and we also watched how hard it was on him. So it wasn't an overnight decision. It was a lots of discussion. It was lots of thought. It was his involvement, um, you know, choosing, his time to come out and say, yeah, I'm a professional athlete who struggled with an eating disorder. And for him, um, that was incredibly brave, knowing that there's going to be consequences. He's going to take some flack on that. It's going to be some feedback for that. And he's like, I'm, I'm okay. I'm confident enough. It's okay to have problems. It's okay to be vulnerable. We make these healthy choices. We empower other men. We empower them. We empower women. We empower everybody to be the exact person that they want to be, whatever their hopes and dreams are. And I really wish that, you know, I don't think there's anybody in the world that would say, you know what, I don't think that that's a good idea. And if they do, then it's not in really logical, I mean, really, where's the logical reasoning in that? It's allowing people to be who they are. 
And I think that that is something that always drives me to allow men to be, it's okay to have problems. Trust me, I still have them. Let's just address them in a healthy way. And you know what strikes me about that is that you are one of the leaders in doing that. Otherwise, it wouldn't have made national news that Mariner player comes out having you you know eating disorder or history of eating disorder, and it was all over. And then it was a huge deal when you decided to become a National Eating Disorders Association ambassador, and actually make that your calling at least this year, right? To share your story and to teach that it's okay to talk about life not being perfect. It's okay if you're a man who has an eating disorder, there's help out there. And so you are a leader in that. And I am so grateful for that. I know that so many people have started talking about it. Like there's a guy out there now, (laughs) like there's a guy talking about it. So I'm curious, um, what your hope is, um, just for people who hear your story throughout individual conversations throughout this podcast, throughout your news interviews and, you know, all the highlights. Um, what's your hope for people as you share your story? That's a really good question. Um, so thank you for those kind words. First of all, um, it's not about me is my, my overall message. This isn't about me. This isn't about my story. This isn't about me. I have found the things that I'm passionate about. I'm very passionate about eating disorders, but I'm more passionate about humanity. I'm more passionate about men and women being able to, whatever you aspire to do, whatever it, whatever it is, to have that hope and dream and whatever that is, to be able to reach that. I want those things to come to fruition. What are your passions? What are your dreams? We're all gonna come into a problem. Always. We always are going to have problems. But what are the nuggets? What are those little tools you can have? So when you don't get that girlfriend in junior high school and you started, or high school, or you need this, or, or you, you fail a test, that it doesn't translate to you being down on yourself for the next three tests. You can say, you know what? It's okay. I didn't do, I didn't, I, I, I failed. Like, it's okay. I'm going to do better on the next one. And that sort of optimistic self-talk is so key. And so hopefully the little nuggets that I can empower in people that I've, I've learned along my journey through baseball, through an eating disorder, through my journey in life, hopefully that those messages from my story and hopefully those things I can portray will be the things that encourage people when they get down to say, it's okay. I may be in this dark place, but the better days are ahead. Well, thank you. I certainly am taking some of these nuggets with me. And I just want to thank you both for sharing your personal stories and um, reminding us that it's not just about your story. It's about a grander story that we're telling ourselves. So thank you both. I really appreciate well, you. Thank you. This is, I, I love tuning in. So please keep this stuff going. It's the best. Um, I'll be an avid listener to continue here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. On that note of being your best self, we would love to hear from you and about what your journey looks like. We're already preparing for Eating Recovery Day in May, and we'll be featuring recovery stories from you, our listeners. To join in, simply write a short letter that embodies the spirit of your journey. Then record it on your phone and send it to us at mentalnote at eatingrecovery.com. That's mentalnote at eatingrecovery.com. Mental Note is sponsored by Eating Recovery Center and Insight Behavioral Health Centers. To talk to a licensed counselor and see if treatment is a good idea for you, call 877-411-9578. Mike Marjama can be followed on Twitter at mmarjama. That's M-M-A-R-J-A-M-A. On Instagram at mike.marjama or visit his website at mikemarjama.com. This episode was produced and edited by Sam Pike with recording by Kevin Larkin. I'm Ellie Pike and Happy New Year.